Hello, my name is Jeremy Coolidge. I am a student at Beverly Middle School, and today I will be interviewing both Mike Cahill and Jamie Zarella, who are running for mayor of Beverly. I would first like to thank BevCam for allowing me to do this interview today. I would also like to thank both candidates for agreeing to this interview. Today we will be discussing the issues surrounding the youth and our schools. I am doing this to promote a program I am working on. I am starting the Beverly Youth Council that will hopefully start in October of next year and will provide a voice for the youth of Beverly. Whoever will be the mayor will run it. I gave the candidates the questions beforehand so they could be prepared to answer. I am doing this because I and many other people would like to hear the candidate solutions to the problems facing the future voters of our city. Hello, Mayor Cahill. Jeremy, good to see today? you. Good, thank you. Okay, I am here, obviously, to talk about the youth and what your plan is for the youth of Beverly mm -hmm. going forward for your fifth term as mayor. If I'm elected, it'll be sixth. Sixth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, so my first question is about um, bullying and harassment in the schools mm -hmm. and what you, as mayor, mm -hmm. will do to, you know, end that or, you know, fix it. Mm -hmm. and make sure that it does not happen again. Yeah. No, that's great. First, thanks so much for doing this, Jeremy. This is really great. Uh, you know, as mayor, I sit on the school committee. And as a member of the school committee, we're actively involved in, in working with the superintendent and her team on curriculum, on uh, trying to ensure the right environment in the schools for learning. Um, we do have a strong social-emotional uh, curriculum in our schools. Um, you know, because you've been, you've been through them, you're in eighth grade, right, mm -hmm. at this point. And, and you know that the responsive classroom um, model and, and uh, principles is used uh, in our schools, and it, it helps to set um, expectations and, and culture in the schools. And behind that is trying to ensure that everyone is respected, everyone is, um, you know, everyone is in a safe space when they're in our schools. I know that in practice, in real life, it, you know, there, you never have a year where everything goes exactly right. And I know that from time to time, um, you know, not every, not every student, not every kid treats everyone else, you know, with respect. And I know that from time to time somebody is, a, is the victim of bullying. So then it's, you know, making sure that the adults in our schools, teachers, paras, counselors, principals, are working to make sure that, that if something happens, it shouldn't, that you know, that the kids who uh, might be bullying are held accountable and things are improved and that any, anybody who might be the victim of bullying is, you know, is um, supported and, you know, and nothing gets out of hand. So th there's the, you know, there's the design and what we try to do to ensure that our 4,600 um, students in our, you know, in our, in our schools pre-K through 12 are always in safe environments and, and environments where learning is, is key. Um, and then it's really about us as the adults trying to make sure that, um, you know, that when things don't go right, that we make sure that they're, you know, that they're fixed and things aren't allowed to get out of hand or to happen again. And, you know, it's, that's really a day in, day out responsibility of, of we, you know, those, those of us who are, who are part of helping to oversee and run the school district and our professionals that are in the building every day with you. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is important in a good working school environment mm -hmm. that and, we and, need. And I'll say, it, it's an every day of the year job because it doesn't work every day, right? And, and, and I understand that. But that is one of our obligations and responsibilities to our kids. So. Okay. Um, some of the students have not have, does, do not have the proper resources to succeed. So what can you, as mayor, do to provide those resources yeah. and help provide them in the schools? So um, one is that when I became mayor, I came from a background of having worked with YMCA's around the state, and I helped start summer learning programs at YMCA. So when I first ran for mayor, I said, if I get elected, we're going to start a summer reading program. And we've now run that nine summers in a row at Hannah School. It's a summer literacy program for rising first, second, and third graders because um, if you're behind on learning to read, then things get tough and, and they get tougher and tougher. We try to make sure that by the beginning of third grade, our students are 
at grade level or cl as close as we can help them get to. So it's all throughout the school year, and then we also offer this opportunity during the summer months to try to prevent summer learning loss and make further gains in reading. So that's one thing we do that's additional to our regular public school year. During the school year, we try to make sure that we provide the resources that our staff need so that our students can, you know, can learn. We spend a lot of time trying to ensure that our teachers have the right professional development, that our curriculum is strong, that the instruction day in and day out is strong. Uh, but there's a lot that goes into kids being ready to learn. You know, we already touched on social emotional learning. We have to make sure that when we have our kids for the six and a half hours a day, for 180 days a year, that the environment is such that they can concentrate on learning and that, you know, that every, every child in the, in the building, every child in the district gets that opportunity to learn. There's a lot to it. There's a lot that goes into it. Since I've been mayor, we've increased city funding for the schools by $17 million. So, I mean, that's just a number. But reality is that between city funding and state funding, we try to ensure every year that the schools have what they need. There's been a lot, um, a lot of challenges that kids have faced because of the pandemic and coming out of the other side. And you, you've lived through it as a middle schooler, right? Um, so we have increased uh, programming. We've increased uh, adjustment counseling, outreach workers. We started the City Connects program to help ensure that kids and families who are struggling come to school better prepared to learn. And, and through that program, we help connect kids to services throughout the community that are part of the, the whole community social service safety net. Um, and so that's a program we brought to the schools and it's funded, it's important to fund, and, and I think it's, it's starting to make a difference for our kids. Okay, um, this question kind of goes hand in hand with the, la with the last question. Mm -hmm. um, there's currently a lack of places for students to, you know, go and meet up with and meet with their friends and do schoolwork and um, you know just kind of hang out so what do you feel needs to be done to fill this gap yeah. in in what services could be offered yeah to the youth it, it's a great question there's the whole array of programming right programs that kids can take part in in the community through a various number of youth organizations, right? So that's all out there. Um, and when you talk about after school hours and out of school time, right, weekends and summers, for a long time we've had the McPherson Youth Center on, on McPherson Drive, which has been there to serve kids as, a, as both a drop-in site and to offer programming. Um, and it's a 50 plus year old building and we decided during COVID that, you know, there, there are a number, number of populations within Beverly, parts of our community, people in our community who are really challenged with COVID. Our kids more than, than anyone else, I mean, our seniors and our kids really um, facing the greatest challenges because of COVID. So we've dedicated some of the federal ARPA funds to build a new youth center. So we've been going through the design process with a lot of youth involvement and youth serving organization involvement and we've designed a new youth center that'll be twice the size of the existing one. So a lot more indoor space to provide both spaces to be and programming to offer. And that is going to start construction next year. So within a couple of years, there'll be a brand new youth center for the kids to go to. Um, it's not the only thing, but it's an important thing. And, and we also have taken some of the ARPA funds and increased the services currently being offered at McPherson more hours, more staffing, more programming. Um, again, it's one piece. There's what we do through the schools, there's what's done you know, formally, there's what's done informally by a lot of organizations outside of city government. But what we're doing right now in addition is trying to make sure that we, we increase offerings for kids at the youth center and we are on, on a path to building a better youth center to better meet the needs of our kids. I have noticed with the um, McPherson Center that they're that not many kids utilize that. They utilize the skate park, mm. but never. I never see anyone in that center. I only see them at the skate park. So I do think it does need a, re, a revamp. And you know. yeah, it's there's there's not as much to offer inside the building right now. And by the way, the skate park is going to stay and get improved, as will the basketball courts. Both of those have stood the test of time. That those are. 
you know, the courts and the skate park keep bringing kids down, yeah. right? And as you know now with the skate park, it's not just it's not just skateboards. It's razors and one wheels and rollerblades and trick bikes and you know whatever whatever kids are riding on one and two wheels that they want to you know play on the on the equipment. And and I think that's an important way to get kids down there to socialize and to have opportunities with our with our staff for mentoring and helping helping kids find their way. Yeah. Um. I was looking at the district's MCAS scores mm -hmm. from last year because I got my, M my MCAS scores back mm -hmm. in the mail. And they are incredibly, you know, below from, previ mm -hmm. from previous years. Do you think that we are, we are challenging the youth looking at testing and not even MCAS, but, um, you know, regular testing? Mm -hmm. Do you think that, um, that there could be something done and what could be done to... Mm -hmm better these scores. Okay. So uh, we're getting a presentation on, on MCAS on this year's scores from the superintendent and assistant superintendent at the next school committee meeting. Uh, I will say that um, it's been hard to evaluate MCAS scores since COVID started. There, there's where we were pre-COVID. There's where we are today. Uh, I think it, it's important to look across the state as well at other districts. Um, because I'm, I'm not sure how, you know, what, what to take from the scores as we're seeing them right now. Um, I will say that one of our district, school district goals for this year, and it has been, you know, a priority of mine, and I, I keep highlighting it, really the importance of rigorous instruction. By that I mean our teachers really setting expectations and teaching and making the demands of our students to achieve, to learn and to achieve. And it's not just about a standardized test. It's really, and the standardized test is meant to help ensure that everyone graduates with a, you know, with a, a base of knowledge and skills. It's really about trying to make sure that everyone reaches that and then goes beyond, student by student, where can you get to as an individual student? So one of the highest priorities of mine is always making sure that the curriculum's strong and that the teaching is strong. And we have, you know, we have a lot of fantastic teachers as a district. We're always collectively working to make sure teachers grow and improve as any, any professional does. Um, and it, 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 it's a, I've said it before, you know, on, an, on other pieces of this, it's a day in and a, and a day out challenge and effort. It doesn't stop, nobody checks a box. This is about you know, our educational professionals and those of us who work with them and oversee their work, trying to make sure that we work throughout the year every day to make sure that we're the best we can be, that our students are challenged, that our students are supported, that people achieve and that, and that you as young people, when you're done with our school district, when you graduate, that you have all the tools, all the skills, all the, all the stuff, right, to, to give you a, a, the best chance at a successful, happy adult life. Mm. Um, what do you feel is the number one issue affecting our youth in Beverly and our schools right now, and how and what would you do as mayor yeah. to fix that? So uh, I don't think we're really treading in, in a different area than what we're already talking about, right? So it, it's, I've long thought that we're really trying to help young people learn how to learn, learn how to think, learn how to question, learn how to challenge, learn how to learn. Developing key skills as well along the way. So it's a combination of skill sets and among the skill sets, just knowing how to go about learning. Um, and it's as important, and it's everybody's job. It's not the school's job only, right? It's within families, within, you know, whatever an individual child's family looks like, you know, support your world. And we as the schools have an opportunity because you're in the schools, you know, for 13 years. Um, the other key besides all the academic is helping young people really develop that strong sense of self and that resilience in yourself as a person to succeed. Because, you know, we all know there, you, you try and you don't succeed. You, you succeed here, maybe not there, and, and so it's, it's really a, it's a journey of learning how to do all these things, and one of the things that I think is most critically important, I just feel it right in here every day, 
is that we want our young students to graduate high school with all the things that we've already talked about and with that real sense of an ability to overcome any kind of uh, challenges because, because you've got that belief in yourself. You've got that understanding of who you are and you know how to do things. Mm. Our youth are the future of Beverly. What could, what could we do to keep these, these uh, young adults in Beverly to live, work, and, you know? Contribute. Yeah. Right? Have, uh, well, I'll say this. Um, what I find is that people who grow up in Beverly, people... Everybody comes here at some point. In my, in my case, it was my parents. Right? In some people's case, it was five generations earlier, or it might have been last week. Right? Everybody comes here and finds this community who lives here. And a lot of us, I think, I think we're the kind of community that people grow up here and love the community and don't want to leave or want to come back if first they go out and explore and, and, you know, and, and, and experience the world some. So how do we ensure that there are high quality jobs? How do we ensure that there's needed housing, both enough and affordable? Um, so th there are a lot of issues that come into play now if you're thinking about you know, how do we hang on to our brightest, don't wanna use that term, how do we hang on to our young people who want to make Beverly home as adults, mm. right? So I think it's, it's a combination of, of trying to ensure that there is economic opportunity and that there's an ability to live here as well. Um, yeah, and, and I think working with our young people who are looking to go into certain professions and talking with them, staying in touch with them after they leave high school, saying, what about coming back and working right here at home? What about working in our schools? What about working in our uh, public safety or you know, one of our departments within the city and or just within the local and regional economy. It is hard for young people to, think, to connect with the city government, let alone even thinking about contacting city government to voice their concerns or ideas. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on starting programs that can help the youth connect with the city yeah. and local government mm -hmm. in the future? I love this question, and I know it's the one you think is among the most important too. So Jeremy, you and I have talked about this a couple of times this year. Um, there's, a, there's an organization called the U.S. Conference of Mayors. It's like, it's like a chamber of commerce for mayors, right? So cities all over the country. Um, and I'm a member of that. And one of the things that I've learned through U.S. Conference of Mayors is there's a, kind of, there's a model, there's a, a best practices for cities to start youth commissions, and I know that's something that you're very interested in doing. So what I'd like to do, if I'm re-elected, and that the election's in another week and a half, I'd like to look at that model with you and other, other young, uh, young folks from Beverly and see how best to get it started. And then, you know, what are the goals of a youth commission? How does it operate? So it really is something that engages with young people and, and provides that opportunity for young people to really invest in how a community's run and where a community's headed. So it's not a something just to say we're doing something, but something that can have a real impact positively. So that's something I want to look into and try to get started in this coming year if it, if it works out. Um, what do, I mean, this is one of your really you know, passionate yes, issues. What, what are you thinking about I mean, it? this interview is one of the reasons why mm -hmm. Is one of the reasons I wanted to promote it. You mm -hmm. know, um, I think that we should start a youth council in Beverly, and that we should get that going off the ground, and that we really should provide a voice for the youth because they have no voice, they mm -hmm. little to no voice, mm -hmm. and there I believe that there is a stigma of politicians not caring about the youth because they can't yeah. vote. Yeah. Because they, <laughs> who cares about them? They can't vote for me. Why bother? Yeah but they are the future of this country and the future of the world, mm -hmm. and we need to start caring about them. Yeah. I think that's a fair point. I, I think in, real, in reality, most of us do care deeply about you, know, you and, and, and your peers. Um, and at the same time, you're right, there's not a lot of opportunity for you to get to speak up and weigh in. And so you brought it to me, I've been thinking about it already, but so many other things going on. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it is important to get started. And it seems that it's um, not, not something to be limited to high school or middle school, but maybe a combination. Um, 
And, uh, and, and as I said, there are some best practices that other cities around the country are using. So first thing we should do is just kind of take a look, learn a little bit, and, and figure out how to get started. And it sounds like you want to be right in the middle of it for the next several years, which would be great. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think that is very important. Um, uh, my, la my second to last question. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that there's a lack of teachers wanting to teach and students wanting to learn. So what would you do to improve this? Um, in, yeah. in like the school systems yeah. and making teachers more enthusiastic mm -hmm. about teaching and students more enthusiastic about yeah. learning. Well, I think we all know that there are a lot of great teachers in our district and great teachers, you know who they are because they bring it every day, right? And, um, and, and I know that there are a lot of students who are enthusiastic about learning. I think the challenge is, right, I mean, the challenge for all of us is to try to take that and make that the, the norm, make that the default, right? The, it's, it's already our expectation, and so our, our school leadership are working daily with our teachers, with our paraprofessionals, with our, you know, all of our various professionals who work in the schools to try to make sure that everyone does bring their best consistently. What I look for, what I'm trying to be helpful in, in ensuring is that our schools are great as much of the time as they can humanly be great. And if our schools can be great every minute of every school day, all year round, that's, that's, the, you know, that's kind of what we're striving for. Uh, and so it is, it's, 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 an every, it's a day in and day out. We have committed professionals running our school district. We have, you know, mostly committed professionals teaching in our school district. So it is really about trying to ensure the, the right uh, resources and the right focus. As I said, the professional development that we use is geared towards the curriculum that we develop. It's geared towards helping our teachers have the best skills for managing classrooms, for delivering instruction, for working with students in all the different ways that kids learn. Um, so I, I would just say, if you feel sometimes and you see sometimes that it's not where it ought to be on a given day with a given classroom and, and subject and teacher, it's something we're working on every day of the year to try to make sure it is, you know, that be, becomes something that you see more and more and more. If you could see it every day in every class for every minute, we'd be, we'd be in the perfect place. Uh, but we're working at it every day. I mean, there certainly are teachers that I have mm -hmm. and I have had that want to teach and like teaching, mm -hmm. but there are also a lot of teachers that just don't, and they seem like they mm -hmm. are just tired, which I understand mm -hmm. because kids can be a handful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it is something we need that should be worked on, and, they, and we should, you yeah. know, be encouraging the children to respect everyone mm -hmm. and encouraging the teachers to know that they are still kids, you know, they're they're being they're learning to be human from scratch and yeah that's true and and it's been a particularly difficult time we know there have been some gaps both in academic learning and in just development right social emotional development that have come with being out of school being hybrid being back in and, and trying to pick up pieces um, and it's been a particularly tiring time for for everybody involved um, you know there are from time to time um, you know, there's from time to time a need for somebody who's a teacher to no longer be a teacher. Uh, I think with most teachers in our district or any district, there's, um, there's a desire to be good at what you do. There's, desire, there's a desire to teach kids and help kids. And so I think it's, um, you know, it, I know that we do it day in and day out, that our, our you know, our, our school district leadership, they're always working to improve how our teachers deliver education and improve the environment in, in our classes. So it's, it's imperfect, but it's something we always are working to get better and better and stronger and stronger. And you were a former teacher, and so I Yeah, you I, know yeah you're right. I taught all anything. through my 20s. I taught for almost 10 years right out of college. So, uh, and I try to get into classrooms as much as I can to, you know, to support our teachers and our kids and see what's happening and be in a position to help move the schools forward. I hope that you can be more after the election. You can be That's more a good point. Yep. Oh, that is a few.
win. Yeah, well, e- either, way, either way, either way, if, if, I, if I win, I'll get to do this for two more years. If I don't, I'll get to come in and see you in class between now and New Year's. Yeah. How's that? That's, you know. Seems pretty good. Yeah. All right, that actually was our last question. All right. So. Jeremy, can I just ask you one? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm thinking it up as I go here, but just to, you, you wanted to do this to make sure that, that, that I and that Jamie, my opponent, each get the chance to be on the record about what's important to youth. Um, what do you most want to see, not pertaining to us, but what do you want to most see happen um, you know, for you and your fellow eighth graders over the next year or so? Well, I want that, that youth council to get mm-hmm. picked up off the ground and Absolutely. started and get it rolling. But I also want to just you know, see more people, more kids respecting each other and mm-hmm. their teachers. And because I um, had a substitute and she was an older woman mm-hmm. and she, she was and she was like, these kids have no respect. And I was talking to her and I was like, yeah, you're right. They do not. They have no respect for the teachers or for, you know, any, anyone. Um, but I do not think that it's entirely the, the children's faults mm-hmm. or anything because it's just how they act you know you they have to, their behavior has to be corrected mm-hmm. but it's not really the teacher's jobs to correct that behavior it's you know the parents and the mm-hmm. and so kind of a, a collective um, sense of responsibility in the community that we all just work to get better mm-hmm. and 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 the schools because all of the students go to the schools it kind of lands in our in our, our teachers laps to try to really help move move things along on all these fronts. So it, it's a challenge, but it sounds like what you're saying is we as a community have to do better mm-hmm. we have a, for, for our kids. Yeah, we have yeah. a duty to provide a better future for mm-hmm. our children, and we should do that. Mm-hmm. I, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, I am here with Mr. Jamie Zarella. Um, who has been a long time Beverly resident and is running for mayor. How, how are you doing? I'm Mr. doing so good, well. Jeremy. Thank you for having me today on your show. Yeah, it's This great. is fantastic. Um, yeah, so I guess we'll just get right into it. Sounds good. Um, I have witnessed in my, in my school and some, and I'm sure the high school, um, that there has been a increase in bullying and outright almost violence with the, with, you know, students and among students. So what will you take to end bullying and violence among students? Well, that's schools? a good question, Jeremy. Um, first of all, what grade are you in? I'm in eighth. You're in eighth grade, so you're a junior, you're in junior high school then? Ah, uh, yes. Okay, school. are you attending the new memorial, um, to the new Beverly Junior High on Cabot Street? Um. The Beverly Middle School. The yes. Beverly Middle School, correct. Okay, fantastic. Um, you know, Jeremy, bullying, um, which leads to violence in a lot of cases, um, and, and also leads to um, other things as well, like, you know, uh, suicide and so forth and so on, is unacceptable to me. Um, that's something I think that today, in today's day and age, that you know, having the proper staffing in schools, in our school system, um, and, able, and able to engage with the children in the school system, and be able to get their attention and working with them um, can help to minimize a lot of that because it seems to me that, they, that the, there's not enough staffing um, in the school system and the, and the teachers are, um, it's a budget thing, you know, right now going forward. The teachers need, um, need the help without, throughout the school system to help these students with dealing with certain issues and also to deal with the, the children that are doing this kind of violence or, you know, bullying and so forth and so on. Um, and, the, and the children, I think, that are, that are implementing it should be reprimanded at the fullest 
whether it be, you know, um, suspended the first time, and if it happens again, um, maybe a longer suspension in, t in, t in talking with their parents, okay, or parent. Um, and then if it, if it happens again, they, they probably more, like, more likely would be expelled. Um, it's not fair to the students that really want to learn in school, you know. Um, what have you experienced? Just constant name calling and people um, getting in fights at schools, like, um, you know, just, oh, meet me out in the field, and it's not, that's not good. Right. Has, has any, has a situation that had ever arise with you? Have you addressed it to? Never like an outright fight or anything, but um, I've been calling. called names right. a few times, and yeah. it's not okay. No, it's and not. It's not at all. Mm. So I definitely would, um, I would partner up with the, uh, with the teachers and the administration, the school committee, um, and sit down and talk with them about it. Yeah. I'd really put a, Put a, put a uh, some type of a uh, prioritized, prioritized plan together to help with that. No, we should. Um, some of the students do not have the proper resources um, in Beverly to succeed. So what, you will, so what initiative will you take as mayor to provide those resources among students? Well, uh, the school system needs a lot, I think needs a little bit of a larger budget. Um, you know, uh, the teachers, our teacher situation throughout the district. Um, I know that the, the middle school um, classroom sizes are too big. There's too many students in, in, in the classrooms. And they don't, have, they don't have enough, the teachers don't have enough help to be able to meet the needs of the students. Mm. Um, and again, you know, everything, everything seems to fall back on the budget, falls back on, you know, what the teachers are getting paid and so forth and so on. And, um, you know, having more paraprofessionals in the, in the industry, especially in our industry, in our school system here, uh, to help the teachers assist with more tools, um, help the students understand a lot better one-on-one. -on -one. So, you know, back in, when I was in school, we didn't, we didn't have 30, 25, 30 kids in a classroom. The, stu the classroom sizes were smaller because I went to the, the vocational school. Um, so it was a little bit smaller classroom size, and it was more. It felt like a more of a one-on-one -on -one type of situation, and you were you, you were more so um, be able to work with the teacher, you know, more direct than you than I think I, what I'm hearing today from the students um, in the school system now. They're having a difficult time, you know, getting the attention of the teachers because they have so many students to deal with. You know, what is, you, what, is, um, what is it actually like for you in the classroom? Um, me? Um, Are you finding that? I think that they're, they're big. There's a lot of students in one class, and I think that it could be separated. And I almost don't think that the, that the fifth graders should be with the eighth graders. I think that they're too close. I think that it leads to more, you know, so you, the they're, they're trying to teach eighth graders the same thing that they teach in fifth graders. Well, yeah, I think well, fifth grade is the same thing they teach in eighth I think graders. That COVID has really set us back. Yeah, that's oh, that. Wow. That is a big problem. That has been a problem going forward since COVID. Yeah, but I think that the classes are bigger, and there's a lot more students in it, and there's a lot more students in general just enrolled right. in the schools. Right. And. Um, Obviously, in the high schools, it's different because the students, you know, they get to different places. They go to Essex Tech or, you know, maybe school choice, and they might go to different high schools. Right. But me, still, I'm sure that the high school has bigger, is even still bigger, or bigger Classroom classrooms sizes. with more students. Yes. Um, you know, um, 
there's no questions about it. You know, the the the, the our school system is is definitely is definitely lacking paraprofessionals. You know, because not every student is at the same learning level in each classroom. So by having a paraprofessional inside the classroom with the teacher, they can go out and sing singly help a, a student that is struggling in the specific areas that they're working on. Um, and right now, you know, we just don't have enough paraprofessionals in the school system to help the, to help the teachers. Right now in your classroom now, do you have a, a, an aide, so-called, a paraprofessional in your classroom? I have noticed that my school hires teachers that are basically just glorified hall monitors. They don't do any, they don't teach or anything. They're not meant there to help. They're not in the classroom. They're just getting paid a teacher's salary to sit around and yell at kids all day. And I think that we should be using those that, you know, sort of teacher, and we right. should be repurposing, you know, that spending in, on hiring those into hiring mm -hmm. those that, type and, teachers and that, that will help. Right, and then again, that's that's where it falls back to to uh, sitting down and partnering up with, you know, sitting down with all the teachers, sitting down with groups of students. Um, you know, if I'm elected mayor, I'd like to be more involved with the students and getting their input. Okay, um, what they think might help them learn differently or learn better um, or be taught better. By the, by the teachers and also to sit down with the teachers and partner up with the teachers in, in the school committee, school committees, um, and talk with them and, and find out what other avenues we can, we can look at to help with that. Yeah. Um, this question kind of goes hand in hand with the last one. Mm -hmm. uh, there's currently a lack of places for youth, for the youth to, you know, um, go to um, you know, spend time with their peers and um, you know, hang out with friends and get work done. Um, and uh, how would, would you, what, as mayor, what would you do to fix, or to like make more spaces for them? So in other words, what you're trying to get is, uh, on this question is, um, the lack of places where students can go and work on their homework and stuff, like after school. Yes. So after school programs. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's you know a really good question. So when I was in school, Jeremy, we used to have we had programs in place um, that they had special teachers that would stay after school. Um, and have all have a little classroom where they have would have four to five students inside, like an after school program. That you could go after school and you could sit with the teacher, more of a one on one situation. They would help you with your math, your English, your history, science, um, and help you to make make you understand it a little more easier. You know, they'd show you different way different ways to go about the the certain problems that you were uh, addressing at that time, whether it be math problems, they would show you a different way to do them. It would make it a lot easier for you to understand. Um, you know, that's another, another thing today, again, that results back to what we were just talking about is the, is the staffing aspect of it. You know, um, you know I think Maybe the possibilities of, of even talking with, you know, um, Endicott College, um, maybe Gordon Cornwell, um, surrounding other colleges in the area, Salem State. Maybe we, could, maybe we could put a program together that some of those students could come at no cost to the schools and work with students after school so that that would help to minimize um, uh, cost, inflicting cost on the city. Yeah, that could be used as like, maybe like um, 
extra college credit or something. Col- for, exactly. For like I was just going to get to that. And that would help the students in the colleges build credits as well. Yeah, for like student yeah. teachers. Yeah. Um, and also about um, places where students can hang out with their friends, because there's a lack of places in Beverly where you could just like go and hang out. So, you know, it's it's funny because going back to the days, again, when I was in school, I, mean, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but, you know, we had the vocational school right here on this property. And it was, it was separated from the high school. Um, and right now, today, they still have a similar program, which is the Essex Tech. And we noticed, but back then they also had the North, what they call the North Shore Regional Vocational School. That was over, it started, it used to be at the Cumming Center at the United Shoe property, and then they moved to Middleton. Um, and it used to be over there by the, um, by the Middleton, um, old Middleton theater, drive-in theater. So, you know, they offer such a wide variety of services from auto mechanics to auto body to carpentry, machine shop. And that helps students today that are more hands-on than they are book smart. Because a lot of people, myself, I wasn't very book smart. I was more hands-on. And that's why I took a trade because I, I worked better with my hands than I did reading a book and understanding it. Um, and that's where I learned most of my you know, techniques and everything from, from the trade school. So I think that you know, by taking that away from, from Beverly, we lost a, a great source of teaching students you know, a trade. And I wish, th- I wish they, they would bring that back and maybe that's something that maybe I could look into be- if I become mayor and partner- partnering up with surrounding cities and towns and maybe opening up another one. So because right now the Essex Tech is full. So they're turning away students, you know, which is not what we want. We want those students to get the education they, they need or they can, that they can do or use um, based on their skills. Yeah, because I think it would be good for the students that fall a little bit behind, like as a place where they can learn something that they can actually use instead of just being in a classroom and not doing anything and being bored. And the Essex Tech will give them like a chance to exactly. you know, do it that. Exactly. It kind of, you know, but, it's not boring when you're there yeah. because you're learning, you know? So, and you're learning a trade, which a lot of today children, you know, I think that's gone to the wayside. You know, the, the structure part of it, um, you know, a lot of kids today couldn't, can't even bang a nail into a piece of wood. You know, never mind fix a flat tire. Mm. You know, and I think that's something that every child or every young adult should learn to be able to change a flat tire on their car once they're able, old enough to drive. So they don't have to depend on outside services, yeah. you know? And with the tech you need to get in, you know, they have high expectations. If you you have to have high grades. And back then, we didn't, that wasn't the expectation back then. You know, you didn't have to have high grades. You just needed to uh, show that you, you, were, you wanted to learn. You wanted to learn a trade. And I think that's something that we should seriously fall, look back on and maybe trying to put another program together like that, and even in, our, in this city. You know, we have plenty of area. You know, the coming center has plenty of plenty of space over there. Maybe it'd be a good place to house something like that. Um, my next question is, um, looking at the district's MCAS scores from last year, mm-hmm. I got my, my MCAS scores in, and they were incredibly low. Um, most of the districts was um, not meeting expectations it was below expectations. Um, and I just want to ask you, are we providing, or are we challenging the youth enough in our schools 
to, um, you know, get back and make sure that we're challenging them enough for the future with testing, not just state te right. testing, but, you know. So I think, um, general. you know, I don't have, I don't have all the answers, um, but I'm going to tell you, I think that, you know, since COVID, you know, two years of being out of school um, and sitting behind a computer all day long or two or three hours out of the day and learning via screen had a tremendous impact on our students. Um, you know, and so that's made it difficult too um, for, you know, for the, the challenges of the youth going forward because I think they've, they've fallen behind a little bit. And I think, um, you know, again, by not having proper staffing in the school system to help bring the kids back up to speed of that lost time, um, that's, that's going to be an issue going forward that, it, that seriously needs to be addressed mm. now. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure you might, you, might agree, you might agree with me and you may disagree with me, but um, you know, the students have fallen behind. And, I, and, I've, and I've heard this quite a bit lately about you know, what the MCAS scores, and that goes right from elementary uh, to the middle school to the high school. Uh, the, te the, school the, the testing going on, that they've, they've fallen through the cracks. And I think Beverly is one of probably one of the worst right now as far as that's concerned. Yeah, I think it's mainly because of um, COVID. COVID has been taking a big toll on our youth, you know. Seventh graders are reading at a fourth grade level, and it's really it's sad because, you know, we used to, the, they, yeah, they didn't, it didn't, wasn't always like this right. before COVID. Right. It, it was, you know, up here, and now it's down here. And I think that is not very... Like I said, by, by bringing in more staffing, paying our teachers so they don't leave an alarming rate, keeping them on board with us. You know, we have a good teacher and we're losing them. And that's not something that the city can afford right now. Um, and again, I'll, I'll revert back to the paraprofessionals having the proper staffing in this classrooms to help with this, to bring the students back up to speed is something we need going forward. Yeah. What do you feel is the number one issue we face right now with the youth of Beverly and our schools? And what, and what as mayor, will you do to fix that? Well, I, you know, Jeremy, I think that... Um, like you said earlier, you know, the, the schools today um, are doing what they can. The teachers are doing what they can with what they have. Um, you know, last year alone, this, well, this past summer, not last year, this past summer alone, we lost 26 teachers out of the middle school. And actually two of them left two weeks prior to the school starting. Now, that's a lot of teachers to lose in a short amount of time. Yeah. And I think that reverts back to the question, the answer that you gave me earlier about the teachers. You think they just glorified hall room mon hall hallway monitors um, and the yelling at the students and so forth and so on. I, this is what, um, this all falls back in the same scenario. I mean, we need to pay us. We need to pay our teachers the necessary salaries that they deserve to keep them here, not leave to go outside the city, to surrounding other cities and towns, for better pay, better compensation, better benefits. You know, I think that Beverly could do a much better job at doing that, and again by adding more aides into the classroom, paraprofessionals, to help, again, with bringing our students back up to speed. You know? Um, and this, you know, and listen, even the after-school programs, I mean, 
the Y offers a wide variety of after-school programs. Maybe, you know, because Beverly's involved, heavily involved with the YMCA, they do a fantastic job. You know, maybe we get, um, maybe we ask them for a little bit more um, so resources to help with the after-school programs and helping to bring some of these students that are, that are falling behind, falling through the cracks to help them bring them back up to speed. You know, even if, um, even if it was during the day and you, 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 know, you have a handful of students in each classroom that are, that are struggling, um, to keep them there and just keep, over, keep looking over them is not gonna help them excel, okay? They need to be brought out, put into a special program that can help them bring them back up to speed again, then maybe place them back into the classroom so that they can maintain that. That, I think, is where it's lost right now. They're, they're struggling to catch up, and everything keeps moving forward because the teachers need to follow the curriculum to keep it, to keep it on pace. Mm. Um, our youth are the future of Beverly, so what could we do to keep them in Beverly to live, work, and you know, contribute? to the city. The youth of Beverly um, is our future. So, you know, as we get older, like myself, we look forward to our retirement. And, you know, at a state level, the youth follows behind us. It's con considered the, the circle of life, you know. Whereas you're going to go go to work and you're going to continue paying into Social Security, and that keeps funding our retirement going forward. Um, you know, again, this is where the students. We used to have a program in in vocational school that the students used to go in, and they would would be in carpentry, and they would have one week they would go out and work in the field where they would build homes. They would build garages with the help of their teachers, working beside them and teaching them. And, and a lot of those homes exist today in Beverly, still today in Beverly, that the students actually built these homes that people bought and still live and reside them today. Wow. And I think that's a great thing for the, for the future of the students. You know, if they're able to learn a trade, and they can carry forth as they, when they graduate and go out and get a job in that field, guess what? They're going to excel. Yeah. Yeah, that is really important to teach all the students valuable life lessons. Absolutely. And in, in multiple fields, because, you know, who's going to build the houses when, when everyone not who does a, it now? You know, there's, there's not a computer job Everything is not computerized today. We still need human manpower to build houses, to build cars. I mean, yes, they're coming up with robots, but you still need manpower going forward. Yeah. Um, it is hard for the youth to connect with city government, let alone even thinking about contacting city government for their... To voice their issues or concerns or ideas. So um, what are your thoughts on creating programs that will help the youth connect with city government in years to come? Well, you know, th that's something that, like, I I've already been discussing since I, you know, um, signed the papers to run for mayor, you know, uh, it's communication. You know, having an open door, structured policy at City Hall, so the people you know come in and meet me two days a week at certain times of the day. Well, I would I would implement a open door, structured policy just for the youth to come in and meet with me and shadow them once or twice a month, certain days. But you can come in. We work together. We go out and you know to different areas and different you know, parts of the city and, and teach you, show you the, the uh, building process where the building permits take place. And, um, 
well, you could just shadow me on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, on a day, on that particular day, whether it be a group of you, four or five of you, um, and take you around and, and to uh, maybe assist in sitting in and shadowing me on meetings and how things are handled. Also, I think I would also look at the fact of possibly um, sitting down with the council, partnering up with the council, all the board councils, and the councils at large, um, so that you could shadow them too in meetings and learn the different perspectives and the codes and, and, and also sit and learn the, the zoning ordinances and so forth and so on, you know? You know, that is exactly what I wanted to do with my youth council that I want to start. That is exactly what I plan for them to do, you know, voice their concerns to the mayor, to the council, and to the school committee because, you know, they don't have a voice until they vote, but they could Correct. in Beverly, and they should. So, yeah, I believe that they should listen in on mayoral meetings and give their opinions on in both meetings for all of them, mayor, city council, and school committee. Absolutely. And bring stuff up for to better help the youth in Beverly? For you know, I, I always, um, in my business, you know, I, I've taken in students that want to work and, you know, um, asked me, you know, could, could I come to work for you and, and sweep floors? And I've always taken students in to help them and teach them. You know, when you start a job, you start at the bottom sweeping the floors, cleaning the bathrooms, cleaning the offices, and so forth and so on. And at the same time, you know, it teaches them structure, okay? Um, today, a lot, of that's, a lot of that's lost in today's society. Um, and then, you know, we move on, and I would, after they would do so-called, what you would call their, their chores when they come in, then I would bring them out into the, into the shop and we'd teach them how to pull a little dent out. In some cases, we'd let them work on old pots, taking dents out and teaching them how to prep the area and how to mix the primers that you're going to apply to the, to the panels, showing them the different steps, you know, and which was, it's very good because they, and they really enjoy it. Yeah, getting back to the question, you, I watched your debate from, what, two weeks ago? Almost three? Um, the one at Ayers, Ryle side. Yes. Um, you said that a woman was trying to get in contact with the mayor's office, and it took her, what is it, what was it, 50? 50 weeks. 50 weeks. Imagine that, but for a kid trying, a, you know, kid trying to voice his concerns to the government. You know, I feel like they're is little incentive for the youth to care if we don't implement that incentive with any programs. Under my, under my administration, Jeremy, that would not happen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. It doesn't happen right now in my own business. I'm, I contact people back right away. Always have, and I always will. And if I'm elected your mayor, I will contact each constituent back within 24 hours period of time. And that goes for students as well. Yeah. yeah, I think communication is key to a stable government. And I think that that is what we need. I city. said it in the debate, without communication, nothing moves forward, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have one more question. Sure. Um, this question goes hand in hand with the last one. There is currently a lack of places for the youth to go get help with their homework and spend time with their peers. What do you feel needs to be done to fill this gap? And what services could be offered to the children of Beverly? It seems like um, I keep uh, reiterating what we, what we talked about previously, but that, you know, that's keeping our teachers, Jeremy. Yeah. Um, you know, when you were, you know, while you're in school, you know, you're going back to school this year, you just started back in September. Um, do you notice any new faces in, as far as the teachers go? 
Uh, no, it's usually the same teachers that have been there for 15, 10, 15 years. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, losing 26 teachers at the middle school is an awful lot of teachers to be losing in, in one shot. Mm. Um, you know, and then, like I said, it, it all falls back to compensation, making sure they're taken care of. Um, if the teachers are taken care of, morale stays above the table. They come in, they want to, you know, not that they're not doing their job now, but they get tired, they get beat down. By paying them, you know, a fair, reasonable wage so that they don't leave and go to other cities and towns, the morale will stay up. Uh. And, having, and having the extra help in each classroom to help them with that. Yeah. There, there are a few teachers, I will say, that do want to teach in... When the teacher wants to teach, it is very evident that the student will want to learn because I have a friend who skips a lot of his classes, but for Spanish class, he doesn't skip because he, he likes the teacher and he likes the class. Well, so a good teacher will make kids want correct. to show up. And, and that's, that's all back, falling back on morale. Mm. You know, if you're, if, you're, if you're taken good care of, as a as a uh, an employee, then you do you want to do your job, mm -hmm. plain and simple. Yeah, you know, um, and you know, if you go into work every day and your boss constantly calls upon you, and there's four or five other employees inside that work facility, but he constantly calls upon you, but yet you don't seem to be get comp compensated for it and you seem to be doing all the work, what happens? You don't, you quit. You start, your morale starts to go down mm -hmm. you because you feel like you're being singled out because you're doing a good job, but you're not being compensated for it. Yeah. And that's what needs to happen in our school system. And, and like I said, and, and along with having the, the paraprofessional DAs come in and work with the teachers to help them, to help the students. Mm -hmm. And there has been um, some teachers that come in, you know, sort of regularly to help. And it was more last year um, than this year. But um, some of the few, some of the students actually liked the teachers that came in to help more than the actual teachers. And the actual teachers, because yeah. Because they were nicer and wanted to help. And it's something new for them too. Yeah. You know, and they're looking, they're looking to, to establish a, a, a home for themselves as well. You know, and, and if you have a good teacher like that, then you want to keep them. Definitely. You know? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's all the questions I have had prepared. I just, you know, I have a question for you. Uh, what would you like to see happen in the school system? Just as far as the future of the youth? Um... I want to get more, the youth more interested in learning and to get more respect put into them because, um, you know, these teachers have noticed, I've, ta I've talked with a few teachers that have, that have been teaching for in upwards to 30 years, and they say that the level of respect has decreased and that students have no respect in the classroom, sometimes some students, and that they just don't want to be there and they don't want to learn so they'll try to make it miserable for everybody even the people that want to learn and right. and they're usually the kids that are you know get bullied and stuff and I think that goes back to the tech and that we should have a program for maybe you know older middle schoolers too um, that want to pick up those jobs it doesn't have to be too hands-on but right. just to learn and, um, you know, get them out of the classroom sometimes because they don't want to be there. It's half the time the teachers don't want them to be there. Um, so it'd be nice to just for them to just, you know, get out of the classroom. So that they can teach the students that want to learn. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Very good. Mm. Excellent job. It was great having being on the show. 
I yeah. thank you very much. And um, if I'm elected, I look forward to working with you. And I look forward to working with you. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that's all we have for us today. I would again like to thank BebCam for televising this interview and the candidates for coming on. We ask all people watching that are older than 18 to please vote on November 7th. Well, that's all. Thank you.